Okay, I think we're there. I think we're there. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> uh, Never yeah, you only got to be off one number. <laughs> well, we made it. And we thank you for joining us today. And uh, we're excited to give you this next presentation from Don Boomer. So uh, without further ado, Don, whenever you're ready, go ahead and kick it off. Yeah, so thank you for sending in all the questions. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of times I get sort of the same question, but asked a different way. And I usually get the same question asked a dozen different ways, but it, the answer is the same thing. The principal part's the same thing. So I thought uh, maybe what I do this time is, is kind of go over some stuff that um, I may have said before, but if it didn't sink in right, maybe I'll try presenting it a little different way because um, if, if we're not communicating, if you're not understanding what I'm saying, then I need to do a better job. So anyway, all right. So what we want to do is, let's see here. Oh, that's interesting. There we go. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about antennas. Um, and really the answers to all your questions are hidden in, in these 10 or 15 things we're going to go over. You may have to put two or three of them together at the same time. Uh, so let's, let's go over these. I promise they won't all be a list that I read to you, but this first slide's going to be. So we have to remember that radio waves essentially travel in straight lines, unless we're talking about being an astrophysicist, because you know, gravity will bend them around a planet, but in 300 feet, we, we're going to call it a straight line, okay? So, so your antenna uh, and your transmitter need to be in line of sight. It doesn't, won't go around a corner. You've got to direct, uh, direct it straight to it. Now, you might bounce some waves that might bounce around a corner, but they obviously won't be as good as direct waves. Okay, so antennas, when you use multiple antennas, whether that be that you've got two whips on your diversity system, uh, or you're using in-ears and uh, uh, wireless microphones together, all those antennas need to be separated by about three wavelengths. That's roughly six feet, depending on the frequency, and I got that at the bottom. Um, at that point, they don't interfere with each other very much, but what happens is, the, the antennas generate a magnetic field when they're when they're picking up radio waves, and that magnetic field jumps to the next antenna and creates current by induction. Right. Uh, so um, so if you basically keep your antennas, and it doesn't matter how many you're using, uh, if you're using forty eight in ear monitors, you're going to use a whole bunch of different transmitting antennas, and they should all be about six feet apart. Not that they don't work if they're closer than that, but they interfere with each other. So they don't work well, right? You know, we're kind of dragging our foot there. So we want a nice clean, we want it, the signals to be nice and clean. So just remember any antennas you have need to be about six feet away from any other antennas you have. Um, and that's even if it's like Wi-Fi and your wireless mics, any antennas need to be at least six feet away from you. Um, RF needs to go through an opening in a single continuous waveform, right? So, like I said, if you, you may look at chain link fence and go, well, water would go right through that all day long, and it will, but radio waves that we're interested in for our wireless mics and the UHF, you know, 470 to 608 band, if the chain links were where two foot squares, it'll go through it. But if they're less than two feet, it blocks the wave, right? And of course, RF uh, doesn't go through metal or water hardly at all. We'll just consider it that, that it doesn't. So, uh, you know, b barriers that are water or metal are gonna completely kill you. Other things, and we'll talk about that, are going to diminish your signal, may work, you know, may not. Um, okay, diversity requires, I get a lot of questions about diversity. And for diversity to work, it has to see two different waveforms that are 
at least a quarter of a waveform different from each other in phase, right? If you think about, you know, we've all seen the classic sine wave, right? So you start at zero, the peak of the first one is a quarter wave, and then it crosses the zero line at half wave, and down to the bottom peak, that's three quarters of a wavelength, or another quarter, and then back to zero. So you have to get those wavelengths at least um, one quarter, wait, excuse me, you have to get you have to get them at least a quarter wavelength apart. So that means roughly six inches. If, you're, if your antennas are closer than that, um, you, you don't really get diversity to happen. And, and any antennas closer than about an eighth of a waveform apart essentially combine and become a single antenna. So you don't have diversity. So here's the, here's the formula. You can remember that. Or if you just keep in your head that, you know, 24 inches is about is about um, one wavelength, right? So quarter, a quarter wavelength is roughly, you know, six inches, depending on frequency, it's smaller as you go higher. Uh, but if you just keep that like two feet is, we, we're, we're counting in, in two foot increments, that's, that's a wavelength. So when we're figuring all this stuff out. Okay, so the other question I get all the time is about quarter wave and half wave antennas. And, you can see there on the left, that's a quarter wave antenna. So it's literally a quarter of the wavelength. So it's six and a half inches. It depends. You can tune them for a specific frequency and make it exactly a quarter wave, or you can kind of make it broad. Um, and you'll see some little whips are, are limited in their, in their uh, frequency uh, range, and some aren't. So that's a quarter wave antenna. It's a, it's a, it's a quarter wavelength piece of metal um, and, and a ground source. Uh, now to make it a half wave, you literally just use two quarter wave antennas, right? And um, so the, you know, the radio wave will, will come into that and, and oscillate back and forth. Um, but it means you don't have to have a ground plane, right? So quarter wave antennas, essentially need to be connected to the chassis of your receiver. Or you can cut a big piece of metal and put it in the middle and then ground that piece of metal. You'd have to have a big metal plate. So it has to have, it has to have the other half because only half of it's there. So they use the chassis as the other half. But that means you can't put it on the end of a coax cable and hang it out in the air. It, it will essentially not work, right? So half-wave antennas are, are usually preferable if the fact that they're a little taller you know gets them up over things a little bit not much of a difference um the gain's about the same it depends on a bunch of things there's actually some crazy inst instances where a quarter wave antenna is slightly more powerful than a half wave antenna by fractions of a decibel we're not going to worry about it uh, but that's what a half wave that's the difference between a quarter wave and a half wave a half wave antenna is literally just two quarter waves in the same package. Okay, so that's that's the mystery there. So line of sight. You have to your transmitter needs to be able to see your receiver. So when we're working with antennas, I, I know people are are less than comfortable sometimes about it, but you really work with it the same way you work with a microphone, right? Um, you know, we, we have to, uh, we, you, you point your mouth at the microphone. If you point your mouth away from the microphone, you know, and turn your back to it, not very much goes in because the sound doesn't really come out of the back of your head. So it's the same way. Wherever you set up your antennas and wherever you hold your transmitter, you've got to be able to see your antenna, whether it's your in-ears coming at you or it's your wireless mic going at the antenna. You have to have line of sight. So if you put it behind a wall, you know, people ask me that too. Well, you know, we've got this hotel ballroom and we're going to cut it in half with this wall. And will it, will it enough leak through? And that's the question. Some will leak through. The question is, is it enough to be reliable? Um, and so here's kind of the, here's kind of the, um, the rules of thumb for these kind of things. Um, and they basically, 
it may not be obvious, but wood, brick, and concrete all have a water content. They're not completely dry. There's an amount of water in them. And the more water that's in them, the higher they're going to block the radio waves from going through, right? Um, so that's why, you know, glass and plastics don't really have any water in them. They may have some other chemicals that, that block it a little bit, but you can see glass and plastic um, uh, it pretty well, it, it just passes through. There's a tiny bit of loss. Unless you have that e-glass, there's a certain kind of glass now that, uh, that that blocks UV and it also blocks radio waves. So these other things are basically how much water is in them, right? So if you live in a, a high humidity place, the, the wood in, in your area has more water in it than a low humidity place. As water, uh, wood is hydroscopic, right? It's, it's taking on or giving off water depending um, on what the, uh, on what the situation is around it. So uh, you can kind of look at these. So, you know, if you got a wood wall, you're losing almost half your signal. Does that still give you enough signal to achieve capture, to give, to give you that 20 dB that well, I talk about all the time? Um, that's called capture effect. That's what we try to do. We get 20 dB of signal higher than the noise floor, and our radio achieves what's called capture effect, and it locks to that signal, and it disregards all the rest of the signals at any other frequency close to it or far away. That's the goal. That's what makes a wireless mic reliable. So if your question is, you know, I'm in a classroom, and can I pick up this wireless mic in the other classroom? The answer is, if you've got wooden brick and concrete walls, if you've got metal studs, you got to think about that. This is how much of the signal is going to be blocked. So if you still can get enough to get 20 on the other side of the wall, and you pretty much have to measure that, then it's okay to do that. It's not a best practice. The best practice is to have a pair, a diversity pair of antennas in each space that is in line of sight with the transmitter. That's the best way to do it. Can you get by with sticking a coat hanger in your radio? You know, maybe someplace in the world, but it's not the way you want to leave things because it's going to be pretty dicey. Um, so again, uh, if you have openings, I get this question all the time, particularly people that, um, oh, that do high school football fields and they want to mount the antenna. They've used a diversity fin um, and they want to shoot it through a glass window. And the answer is, as long as that window is bigger than two feet square, the radio waves will pass right through it, okay? And you can see. So depending on what frequency you're at, uh, you could actually be closer to 20 inches if you're, if you're very high in frequency. This is why it's a, I should also mention, this is why it's a problem when you have a metal studded wall with the studs 16 inches on center. It won't, you have to think of your radio wave as a stick, and it won't pass through that. The, the studs would block it, you know, so or most of it anyway. So when you have, when you have, if it's less than a wavelength, so I've got one wavelength between the two arrows. If the opening is smaller than that, it's going to block all or most of your signal, right? So those, just remember two feet, same way. Um, people want to know, can I put an antenna above a uh, drop ceiling? So most of the time, you know, drop ceiling is paper. Again, it's going to hold some humidity. So it's going to have some water in it. Um, hopefully it's not one of the ones with a whole lot of metal flake and stuff in it. That's going to block even more. But yeah, you could put an antenna most times directly above a drop ceiling tile, which is a two foot by four foot square. So just kind of get it centered and get it close and you'll have very little loss. You can do those kind of things. Um, but I want to talk about something. I, I get this question a lot where people think, uh, you know, how I'm going to do diversity. And it may occur to them like, uh, well, if I put an ant, <clears throat> and I'm using a football field, but this would be any big space, right? So if I put, if I put an antenna on each end pointed at each other, well, maybe the one on the left doesn't cover all the way to the end but I've got nice, good, strong signal. And of course it covers forever, but the, the, it's diminishing, right? So it's going a million miles that direction, but it gets weaker and weaker. Okay, 
So you think if you think about it this way, so I've got a nice strong antenna, you know, on the left side here covering across the field. And then if I put one on the other side, they're going to overlap. Um, and uh, I'll cover most of the field with both of the antennas. But what I don't get with both, I'm going to get on the other side. And the answer is, yes, this might work. But remember, in those two spots, you no longer have diversity, right? Because it, if the signal were to try to jump from one antenna to the other, the other one is so weak that it may not have enough signal. So this, this depends on a whole bunch of things. But you don't, you don't want to put your antennas across from each other shooting across. I mean, it might work if it's very carefully calculated out, but it's not the way to do it. What you want to do is put both your antennas on one side, roughly six feet apart, right? And then just shoot across that field. Now, you're going to have to deal with distance. Uh, there's a range involved, and the range is how strong the signal is until it drops down into the noise floor closer than 20 dB. That's always your limit. But this is the way you want to do it. You don't want you don't want to cover things from two sides. Or I get this question all the time. Will it be better if I cover my stage with an antenna on each side? And the answer to that is no, unless you can actually keep one antenna in one zone and the other antenna in the other zone. When you get to the spot in the middle where both sides are picking it up, then it's, then it's bad, right? You want one antenna pair or the other diversity pair to pick up your signal, but you don't want multiple antennas. It doesn't make things stronger. And again, back to microphones. If you were to use a microphone that way and cover it on two different sides, um, your your signal would be very um, would be very uh, it, it it would have a phase cancellation in it. It's going to sound like you talk through a cardboard tube. And that's the same thing that happens to your radio signal. It, the, the signal gets, you know, less than good. And now the radio receiver might be able to deal with that or it might not, depending on other things. So we want to keep it good by kind of staying away from that the best we can. Uh, so the other question I get a lot is it involves aiming antennas. And aiming antennas is what are we trying to do? Right. So a bad analogy, but it's best I got is, you know, if you're trying to cover everywhere, then you want to flood that your coverage. You want to flood your coverage area with um, with antenna signal. Right. But if you really only want to cover the stage, which is the way most people probably do this, we don't want an antenna that covers everything because an antenna that covers everything is gonna find junk we don't want. It's gonna find noise and put that in the system. If really I'm only interested in picking up the people that are on a stage, I don't wanna pick up what's going on behind me, you know, because it's just more noise being introduced into the system, right? So if we look at a, well, there we are. It's just a matter of picking the right tool for the job, you know? Sometimes one is considerably better than the other. Sometimes it's a toss-up. Um, it just depends on exactly what you're trying to do and that you have control over, right? So, if we, you know, if we pick up only the stage, but then you get somebody that jumps off the stage and runs to the other end of the building, you better know about that beforehand so you have antenna coverage out there. Um, but if you don't have to worry about that, you just keep it on the stage. So, so... Mostly what we call omnidirectional antennas, whip antennas, um, actually aren't omnidirectional. They're, they're toroidal. They're a donut shape. They're, they pick up in 360 degrees in the horizontal plane. And that's usually all we worry about because most of the time I don't have people six feet tall on the stage and 30 feet up in the air at the same time. If you're doing the Royal Albert Hall that has four balconies, well, maybe that's what you got to do. But for the most part, um, it it's not necessary, right? So this is this means this this antenna is going to pick up electromagnetic waves coming at it from every direction horizontally, and 
So I've marked out D for distance. And of course, it never stops. It goes forever. But there's a range that you get where it's strong enough to work, right? So we can assign some value to that. Um, so, so again, it's, it, we're spreading out in all directions. So when we make this antenna directional, like a paddle, essentially what we do is we cut it down so that the antenna only picks up in one direction and it's essentially dead on the other side. Okay, now we have a directional antenna. But what happens is, is that we take that, that dead space uh, and it gets added on the front side. So a directional antenna, uh, if it was 180 degrees, will have twice the distance on one side and nearly zero on the other. We still get, you know, we get 10 pounds. We can make it short, fat, or long and skinny, but we still get 10 pounds. So what we've done is we've got our 10 pounds on one side and our zero on the other. Now, if you look at most uh, paddle antennas, they're 140 or 120 degree range. So we're narrowing that a little bit more, which means there's even more than two times the distance on one side, uh, if you think about it that way. Um, and again, like I said, these antennas have no distance limits. They'll do millions of miles. It will be extremely weak, but they go forever, right? We're picking up Voyager circling around Pluto. It's coming back. It'll travel all the way across space into the antennas here on Earth we're capturing it with. So just remember that it, it goes, it, it gets weaker with distance, right? Inverse square, same way your loudspeaker does, right? You get farther away from your PA stack, it gets quieter outdoors indoors you get you know you get critical distance and you get room reverberation but you know if you were outdoors where you weren't getting reflections back um it, it it dies with distance and so antennas get weaker with distance but they never actually get to zero right okay so if we look at these in a space again i'm just using a football field but it could be a rectangular room like any shape room doesn't matter what the space is if we, if we put the antenna there in the end zone, we are with a directional antenna, we are really only picking up signal from the field and then out in whatever, you know, it, you can see it spreads out. Um, but we're picking up, you know, we're picking up our radio waves from that direction. Uh, if that's what we need to do, then we want to use a directional antenna. If we put the omnidirectional antenna in the same spot, I'm picking up the field. I won't be as strong as, as we go out across the field, but what it will be, it'll be strong in the other direction as well. So if you need to pick up the football field and you need to pick up the parking lot that's on the other side of the fence, then you want to use an omni. But an omni, when you use an omni, it generally has to be in the middle of your coverage area where a directional antenna is on the outside looking in. Uh, so, I, I mean, I use directional antennas 99 to one over omnis. An omni, I use omnis outdoors a lot. 99% uh, of the omnis I use, I use outdoors. Uh, you know, if you're doing theater in the round, well, you know, then that's, that's the case for an omni, but I, <laughs> I've done theater in the round once or twice in the last 40 years. I just don't do that. Uh, but anyway, so it's just a matter of, of, of picking the right tool for the job. So if I don't need to pick up that the parking lot, then what I am picking up by using, this still may cover the whole field, okay? It depends on a lot of other things. But it's going to pick up the garbage that's the other direction and add it to the noise floor, and I don't want that. It may still work perfectly but it won't work as well as if it wasn't picking up that other garbage, right? So again, same way, if you, if you have a little auditorium or a church or whatever it is, the same, same thing happens. You know, if really what I wanna pick up is the stage, then I shoot my antenna towards the stage and it spreads out across the room and you just simply look at the, look at the pattern of your, of your antenna, whatever it is, Make yourself a triangle or a circle that, that fits that pattern and lay it over your floor plan. You know, so, so some, one of the questions I got this week was how to, uh, what should I do? Uh, 
walking into a job for the first site, what do I need to check? You need to get a floor plan. You need, you need to t- decide what you need to cover and you need to measure your noise floor. Uh, those two things, that's, that's all the pre-work you can do. I mean, you have to understand how many mics and stuff you want, but in terms of making radios work, that's it. Just those two things. Know what your noise floor is and know what you need to cover and then point the antennas at what you need to cover. Again, if I'm doing an outdoor thing, uh, you know, in the middle of a park and I got to get the car show in one direction and the hot dog booth in the other direction, uh, then I put an Omni in the middle. Uh, if I only need to pick up, you know, the stage and it's at one end, I point, I get a directional antenna and I point it at the stage. So that's, that's how you pick between an Omni and a directional. Um, and, um, you know, it's it's really that simple. Just just pointed at pointed at your transmitters. An omni is pointing in all directions, so you can have transmitters in all directions, and a directional antenna is pointing in some direction to some to some uh, horizontal width, right? Like I said, a paddle antenna is usually about 120 degrees, 140 something like that. You use conical antennas; they're 70, 60, 45. You can get very narrow ones like using a shotgun microphone, if that's what you need, you know? Okay. So now you know how to pick. So you can pick a directional antenna or an omnidirectional antenna. Just use the right one. I, unfortunately, I get a lot of people that go, I'll use an omni, it'll cover everything. It's like, I don't want everything because half of everything is noise that I actually don't want. I don't want to add that in. And you're adding that in. So um, that may intuitively until you think about it a little bit covering everything may seem like a good idea usually it's i want to cover everything and i want as high a power as possible it's like no you don't want either of those two things unless that's exactly what you want but if that's not exactly what you want don't go there um so uh the other question i get a lot is what why do i need to use a distro or a combiner for my wireless mics or my in-ears and there's basically two reasons that we do this. Um, we we want to minimize the number of uh, antennas because, like I said, otherwise we got to spread them out six feet apart. Um, that's pretty tough to do with you know eight little whip antennas on your on your receivers spread out across the desk. That makes a mighty wide desk. So uh, that's that's one reason to do it. And the other is we can reduce the noise floor. That's, that happens from intermodulation due to the way the electronic circuitry treats the signals compared to the way they would normally just mix in air if you just start tran- if you have antennas all over the place and you start transmitting. So and then of course there's a third thing that's easier and neater to do it in a rack instead of having stuff all over the place. but okay. So intermodulation just means that when when radio waves mix, they create additional radio waves, right? Um, So it's it's a very simple formula. You, whatever your two frequencies are, you get a, you get those two frequencies, plus you get a sum of the difference and a, and a a minus of the difference, right? So if there are, you know, if there are one megahertz apart, you get, you get a, a, a phantom radio station that's one megahertz above your highest frequency, and you get one that's one megahertz below your highest frequency, right? Pretty easy to do with that. When you add more, when as you add a third mic, you're adding it to four. It's not one plus two, it's one plus four. So you're building up a lot of extra frequencies quickly. And this is, it's extra, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, they're sidebands, but they're actually radio stations. You can measure them all day long. They're garbage. Uh, there's not, you know, they don't they don't transmit your audio anymore. But they're a strong signal, and you can measure them. And so, as these things add up, they're taking they're adding to your noise floor, right? Uh, which is not a good thing. And they're actually blocking open channels that you might otherwise tune to. So what happens? Uh, here's a Here's a thing we shot looking at combine eights, and this is only looking at, at uh, third order harmonics. But you can see in, in each case, there are eight in-ear transmitters spread 
uh, across those band, uh, that, that bandwidth, and it doesn't really matter what it is, but you can see the difference in how much extra garbage there is or there isn't just by doing it with a combiner. And the same kind of thing happens with a distro. So it's just the way the electronics treats the signals differently. We're able to build some protections in. So I wanna show you the, the problem with the harmonics is they build up at three times the rate of the power. So if we look at this, so here's a pair of transmitters turned on. It doesn't really matter what the frequencies are. It matters a little bit, but the, just to understand the principle. So you can see that these two uh, radio transmitters are coming in at minus 21. Okay, so that's the, that's the strength of their signal. And the inner mod, the other two frequencies that it's making are 75 dB down. So they're 55 roughly dB below the, the intended transmitter. Remember, we're always looking to maintain 20. Okay, every dB more power that we have, either because we're talking louder into our mic or we're adding more mics, raises the noise floor by 3 dB, right? So here I'm going to add 1 dB to the power. It went from minus 21 to minus 20 and a half, right? So it went up 1 dB. But look at the look at the inner mod. It went up uh, it went up almost 5 almost 6 dB to 71. So every time I add 1 dB more to the power, the D, the inner mod comes up times 3. See how fast it's rising? And it, it's the same thing. It, it's that old, you know, that one where you double a penny every day and you got, you know, for 30 days. And at the end of 30 days, you've got $2 million. Even You're doubling every time. This is going up times three every time. It's growing up even faster. So I keep adding 1 dB to the power. Here we are. And look how fast all this other junk comes up, right? This is why we have you turn the power down on your transmitters as much as possible, because that's going to help in addition to the distros. But I keep going up 1 dB in power, and now look at all the super powerful. Those are more powerful, some of them, than my original transmitters were. So you got your choice, right? So uh, here we've gone up 20 dB in power. We've gone up 60 dB in intermod strength, right? So that's, I'm not saying it won't, I'm not saying it can't work. It can work. And that's, as long as you don't cross the threshold that knocks you off the air, you're good to go. But if you do, you're, you're just making it harder for yourself. So we want to use low power and we want to use, um, we want to use distros and combiners. And this isn't counting the antenna interference either. So um, this is just the power through the distros. This is so we, we can keep that power down the way we treat the signals inside. Um, so that it, you still get some intermod. It's not possible not to get it, but we keep it way, way down. So this is what you avoid when you use a combiner or a distro. So those are the things I did want to cover. And then um, Adam, I think we had some other questions um, that we can talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few good questions here uh, I'd like to call out for you, Don. Hopefully we have the time. When using a helical for in-ears and log periodic paddles for wireless mics at the same time, I've always put my helical in front so it's not hitting the back of the paddles. Is this enough or should I be separating more? Well, that's a good thing to do. Uh but usually, it, it, so in the case of the helical and paddles, you got to remember that the helical antenna has a much narrower pattern coming out. It's not going sideways as much as the uh, the uh, the paddle antennas are, right? Uh, but it is still going backwards and it is still going sideways. So as you move it further ahead of the of the wireless microphone antennas, you're actually showing more of the back dead side to those. So it's a benefit. Yes, you can do it. It's kind of hard to do on a permanent situation because that means you got to mount your your in-ear um, antennas off the wall and then you can mount your wireless mic antennas on the wall. But if it's portable, um, it's easy enough to do if you're, all your antennas are up on mic stands, so to speak. So it's a benefit if you can do it. 
It's a good thing to do. It doesn't make a huge difference, but again, just, you know, one straw that breaks the camel's back is the one that breaks the camel's back. So every straw we can take off by being more clever about how we set this stuff up or that's inexpensive to do, we want to do those. And that is one of them. So yes, when you can do that, you want to keep, you want to keep your antennas, um, your, your transmitting antenna, you want to keep the dead side of your transmitting antenna more focused at your receiving antennas because you got one that's pitching and one that's catching. So you, you want to throw forward. You don't want to throw backwards. So, yeah, that's a good idea. Very cool. Good answer, Don. Thank you. This is a, a, a puzzling question. Certainly, I think it will be interesting to you. We'll see. If an omni antenna is in the middle of a room, um, on the ceiling, would there be a null directly underneath the antenna? So that's a good question. If it's a whip antenna, yes, there is. Remember, it's a donut shape. Um, now you're closer to it, right? So, so you can you can afford a little bit of a null. Our um, diversity omni is, uh, I believe, a unique antenna in the fact that it is truly spherical. So it's the shape of a ball, not the shape of a donut. So with that, with our with our D omni antenna, there is no null spot under it or above it. With other quote unquote omni antennas, yes, there's a dead spot, or I should say a dim spot above it and below it. So I mean it's it's I can't say that it works or doesn't work. It's it doesn't it it's it's deader uh, below it and above it. So you know, if you're if you're <laughs> if your ceiling's a hundred feet high, we got a different answer than if it's twelve feet high. But um, but yeah, that's do you have to remember that when you're when you're doing it that way? Very cool. Thanks, Don. Here's another esoteric question for you. What are the benefits of higher end IAM packs that have two antennas? It seems at close distance, it wouldn't be diversity. And IEM packs that have two antennas. Yeah, the really high-end diversity IEM systems that cost a lot, right? Well, you can combine those. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's not what's happening. Um, right. You put multiple multiple channels together. You could have it could have a hundred antennas. You could combine them all. Well, that's crazy, but you could you could combine them all to a single antenna. So so um that's that's not a problem. So if you're talking about like PSM 1000s, if you use PSM 1000s with a combined four, you can only use two of them because they're going to have four antenna outputs that you need to run into that combiner, and then you're going to run that to a single a single antenna. And then I actually I just had a phone call this morning. I guess like that kind of goes with this same question. Uh, the guy said, "Well, I don't understand how I can have stereo in ear monitors." but I'm only transmitting on one antenna. Don't I need to transmit on two antennas? And the answer is, well, no, they don't. Th that's on a single channel, it's multiplex. So it's the same way, it's the same way your TV can do stereo on one channel. In fact, now when you go to digital television stations, you'll notice you know, that you can go to channel 24.1, channel 24.2, .3 or .4, for example. They're all being transmitted on the same single frequency block. It's not a single frequency, but they're all being transmitted over the top of each other. The, the, the multiplexing system just knows, you know, for this part of the signal, I look for this channel and this part of this, because they, because those signals tied together, they know exactly where they are, Right. So if I was looking at sprockets of film, I can say sprockets one and two go to the left channel, three and four go to the right channel, then five and six go to the left channel, and seven and eight go to the right. It knows where they are. There's plenty of time in between. So it, it, it may seem like that's a lot of time, but in nanoseconds, it can do this. And, and your hearing is the same way that we watch film being projected. It's a bunch of still shots, but it looks, it looks like it's moving. Same way your ear heard is moving. So um, that's how they do it. It's just just multiplexed. Um, so in, in any event, there's no problem combining that. It's the same way. Uh, if you think about it, you know, your television antenna, well, we don't use television antennas. The car antenna that you have can pick all the radio stations of the dial up. 
You just play them back one at a time. They're all going into that antenna. It's just you're telling your receiver, pay attention to this one or that one. But they're all there at the same time coming down that antenna all at once. Very cool. I think we've got time for one more here. And I, I see this question an awful lot, so I think it's a really good one. Okay. What clearance is required from structural metal objects to avoid reduced performance, or how can this be calculated? Oh, well, to calculate it, probably about pointless um, because it's going to be tiny numbers. So, um, so one thing I, I used to uh, develop some wireless mics and we were doing testing outdoors. And one of the things that was interesting, so we had a long, narrow industrial buildings, long, narrow alleyway with a whole bunch of buildings in a row that had overhead metal garage doors. And you could walk down, I could walk 600 feet away and it would transmit. But every time I walked by one of those metal doors, it would drop out right at that metal door. Um, so the answer to that is it depends how dead your antenna is on the back side, or if it has a plane. Um, our CP beam is the only antenna that we make that has an actual barrier on the back side. So a CP beam, it doesn't, it doesn't know there's a metal wall behind it. Something like a diversity fin or, or a de-architectural antenna is not completely dead on the back side. And so the real answer is three wavelengths. At about three wavelengths, it's so tiny that we're not going to worry about it anymore. But, you know, it's pretty hard to mount a wall-mounted antenna six feet out off the wall. Uh, that's something you want to do if it's on truss, then you, you, you definitely want to put a, a, an extension arm or something. Don't mount it flat on the truss. You're going to lose a little uh, with a directional. So something like a deep fin is not going to lose very much because it's essentially going forward. But it is a little bit on the back and it's going to get a little bit of interference. So if you really want to, you don't necessarily have to worry about that. That's one of the factors in your build up for 20 dB above your noise floor, because that it's you're going to get garbage in the back. It's going to add to your noise floor. The question is, does it add enough to cause you a problem? Um, and you may be able to pull something somewhere else so that it doesn't. It's a factor. It's always a factor. There's no way to avoid it. Um, you know, we're never going to make this stuff perfect, except in, you know, laboratory anechoic Faraday cages, you know, which nobody's ever going to have in the real world. You just have to get it good enough that it's always going to work. You know, I don't know what that is. 80%, 90%, 99%. You're never going to achieve a hundred percent. You just can't make it perfect. Um, and that's one of, that's one of the moving issues that, that you have actually just even up against a wall, even just the, you know, sheetrock or wood causes a little bit of reflection. It's not nearly as bad as metal, so it, it hardly matters at all with a directional antenna. Now, if you've got a whip antenna, you don't really want to mount that right up against a wall. You're going to get you're going to get much more signal degradation with that antenna up against a wall than you will with a paddle or a defin or something like that. Very cool, Don. And I think with that, that's about all the time we have. Uh, so, you know, we couldn't get to every question, but we'll do our level best to reach out to you or certainly, you know, email me or Don. It's just our first name, adam at rfvenue.com. Don at rfvenue.com. We're happy to answer your questions. And thanks again for your participation uh, in the webinar. And we hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you on the next one. So thanks, Don. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, guys.